This is a video lesson for AS Economics on the topic of Price Elasticity of Demand, or PED. The lesson objectives are that you should be able to define price elasticity of demand, you should be able to explain the difference between elastic and inelastic products, you should be able to explain the determinants of price elasticity of demand, you should be able to calculate the PED coefficient, and you should also be able to interpret the PED coefficient. So the first thing we want to do is get the definitions right. First one is price elasticity of demand. You'll see in your textbook that, it, that this is the responsiveness of the quantity demanded to a change in the price of the product. In other words, we're saying that if the price goes up, how much does the quantity demanded go down? Now we've seen before that price and quantity demanded have a negative relationship, which is why the demand curve slopes downwards. What price elasticity of demand does is it tries to measure that relationship. So if the price goes up, does the quantity demanded really changes? And if so, um, well, that's basically what we're trying to measure um, with, with, with this term and with this idea. So the, fir the next thing we have to think about is what makes something elastic versus inelastic. So if a product is price elastic, that means that the, if, the, if there's a percentage change in the quantity demanded is sensitive to a change in price. That's the textbook definition. In other words, these are products that people stop buying when the price goes up. So when we think about what inelastic means, a price inelastic product is one where the percentage change in the quantity demanded is insensitive to a change in price. In other words, these are products that people still buy even when the price goes up. So now we have to think about the determinants of elasticity, or what makes a product more elastic or more inelastic. The first one is availability of substitutes. The next one is the necessity of the item. The third is the price of the good in relation to income. The fourth is time. And the fifth is the breadth of the product definition. And we're going to go through each one of these in turn. So first of all, availability of substitutes. What this means is, is there something else that you could buy instead of this product? Now the best example that I like to think about this is milk, because if you're going to put something on your cereal, I know that there maybe you might be able to put almond milk or soya milk on, but really, unless you want to use one of those two items, there's only one thing that you can use, and that's milk. So milk is probably going to be a bit more inelastic, because there are so few substitutes that you can use if you want to put something on your cereal. Other examples of this would be petrol, again, not very many other things you can substitute if the price changes. And also festival food is a good example. If you are at a festival and you're hungry, you look around and you see the food that's on offer, it's not like there's exactly much choice. If you're already there, you can't exactly just leave the festival and uh, get a quick bite to eat, which is why you'd find that usually at festivals food is so expensive because it's price inelastic. So the rule here is that the fewer substitutes there are for the product, the more inelastic or insensitive to price the product is going to be. The next one is very similar. It's the necessity of the item. How much do you need this product? I think the best one, example of this is petrol. If the price changes for petrol, well, unfortunately, I need petrol to get to work. Most people need petrol to be able to drive. So if the price changes, there's not much I can do about it. Other, ex other examples would be medicine. Again, you need this product, so a price change doesn't really affect how much you buy it. And even cigarettes and drugs could be a very good example for this. If you're addicted to something, the price of the item could change. You're still probably going to buy it. So the rule here is that the more you need the product, the more inelastic it's going to be. Next one is the price of the good in relation to income. In other words, how much of your income do you spend on this product? Now, when I think about this, I think to myself, how much of my income do I spend on chewing gum? Well, let's see. Chewing gum probably costs about 50p to a pound. I only buy it every so often. And to be honest, when I buy it, it's usually to break, break a five pound note or something like that. And it's not something that I really pay attention to the price about. So really, if the price of this product were to go up, or maybe even double, I'd probably still buy just about the same amount. Whereas if I think to myself, if I'm buying a new car, well, this takes up a lot of my income. I'd be really researching the product, seeing how much it costs, see how much it costs in, other, in relation to other things. I'd, I'm pretty serious about how much money I'm going to spend for this. So I'm probably going to be pretty sensitive if the, if the price goes up. I'm probably not going to buy that product. So the rule here is that the greater percentage of your income, the more elastic the product, 
and the more the lower the percentage of your income the more inelastic the product so the car is going to have an elastic value whereas the chewing gum everything else being equal is going to be a bit more inelastic the next one has to do with time how much time is there between the change in the price and the, the response and quantity demanded so let's think about the idea of petrol again Let's say that I drive to work, a 1959 Cadillac Eldorado. Now this is a V8 engine, very, very poor fuel economy. It basically drinks petrol. Now if I need this car to drive to work in a week, I'm not really going to have much choice if the price of petrol goes up. I'm just going to have to pay it because I've, I've got an old car that uses a lot of petrol and there's not much I can do about that in a week. But over the course of a year, if the price of petrol is still high, I'd probably be thinking twice about driving that car. I might think to sell it, might think to buy a more fuel-efficient car. Let's say I buy a Toyota Prius. This has better fuel economy, so within a year, say, I'll be able to buy less petrol. But the point is that the immediate effect in the short term, it's probably not, I'm probably not going to be able to do much about it, whereas in the long term, I will be able to change my behavior. So the rule for this is that the more time you have between the price change and the response and quantity, probably the more elastic the product is going to be. And the last one is the breadth of product definition. When we're thinking about this, we have to ask ourselves, are we talking about the whole market or just one brand of the product? So when I'm thinking about this, I think about bread. Bread, on the whole, is going to be fairly inelastic, like we said. People need it. Very few substitutes for bread if you're making a sandwich. So I'm thinking to myself, if the price changes of bread, probably not going to see very much change in quantity demanded. However, if we're talking about just one specific type of bread, well, if the price changes on that, then I might switch my, well, the actual bread that I buy. I might stop buying Hovis, I might buy something else. Um, so basically what we're saying is that the wider the definition, if we're talking about the entire market for bread, the more inelastic the product's going to be. But the narrower definition, if we're talking about just one brand, it's probably going to be more elastic. So some other examples, and if you want to, you can pause right now and think of a few um, to fill in this list and then check with the list that I'm going to show you. So when I think about this, I think inelastic products are things like petrol, medicine, milk and dairy products, bread in general, cigarettes or drugs. Again, these things all have in common the fact that they are few substitutes, people need them. And then, in, sorry, then elastic products would be things like Hamburgers, because if the price of hamburgers goes up, well, I might decide to eat a hot dog instead. Orange juice, because of course, grapefruit juice, apple juice, these things are close substitutes. Foreign holidays, not really necessary, and I could probably have a domestic holiday if the price changed. Entertainment, again, probably not really necessary. And a particular type of bread are all going to be elastic products because they have, they have many substitutes that you'd be able to, to switch to if the price of them changed. Right, now let's think about the calculation of the price elasticity of demand coefficient. The price elasticity of demand can be described by a number. Now what this number is, is quite simply just a fraction that you're going to have to learn. This fraction is the percentage, the percentage change in price underneath the percentage change in quantity demanded. Now this makes sense because as we said, the price elasticity of demand shows the sensitivity of quantity demanded to a change in price. So it's only natural to think that, the, that these two things are going to be involved in the actual formula. Now, as economists, we'll probably be using some shorthand for these. So it's also a good idea to think about the price elasticity of demand equals the percentage delta P, whereas delta just means change, and then the percentage delta QD which is to say the percentage change in quantity demanded. Now, I always like to have tricks to make sure that if I'm in the middle of examination, um, I, I can remember the right formula. And all you need to have for this trick is to think a simple rule, the queen rules over the people. This has gotten me out of a lot of close scrapes because I just think to myself, right, what's the formula for price elasticity of demand? Well, the queen, quantity demanded, rules over the people. And in fact, that's actually going to work for just about all of our elasticity um, calculations that we'll see in the future. So 
The only other thing we need to think about is a reminder of how to calculate the percentage change. Percentage change has its own formula, where if you have two numbers and they've changed, you take the new number, subtract the original, divide it by the original, and because it's a percentage, we multiply by 100. Let's look at an example, like the kind that you might have to do it for your homework or in an examination. If the price of petrol changes from one pound per liter to one pound ten per liter, and we then see as a result the quantity demanded for petrol changes from 60 million liters per day to 57 million liters per day, using that information you should be able to calculate the price elasticity of demand coefficient. We'll do that together just to make sure that you've got the hang of it. Right. The first step is that we calculate the percentage changes using the formula we saw a couple slides ago. So, let's start with the percentage change in price. Remember, it's the new minus the original, so one pound ten minus a pound, and we don't have to put the, the pound signs in, but I am keeping it to two decimal places just for clarity. Divide it by the original, which is a pound, times by 100 because it's a percentage. Now, this simplifies to say, well, the one pound ten minus one pound is 10p divided by the original pound times by 100. Um, the not 0 0.10 divided by um, 1.00 is not 0 0.10, again, times by 100. And so when we, when we make that calculation there, it comes out as 10%. So the percentage change in price is changed by 10%. Then we calculate percentage change in quantity demanded. As we said, it went from 57 million to, sorry, it went from 60 million to 57 million. So the new minus the original divided by the original times by 100. So 57 million minus 60 million is minus 3 million. It's important that we keep that minus figure in there. Divided by the original times by 100, minus 3 million divided by 60 million is a number not, minus not 0 0.05 times 100. And so this gives us minus 5%. Again, very important that we include the minus in there to show that the actual quantity demand has gone down. The second step in this is to use the figures in the price elasticity of demand formula. As we said before, the price elasticity of demand is a percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. So we saw from before the percentage change in quantity demanded was minus 5%. The percentage change in price was 10%, so all we have to do is plug these into the formula. So, minus 5% divided by 10%, and at this stage here, we can actually forget about the percentages. We're just going to be putting the numbers into the calculator or doing some quick mental maths with this. So it's minus 5 divided by 10, which is minus 0.5. Now, that figure there is not a percentage, it's just the relationship between those two, the minus 5 divided by 10, and that is the price elasticity of demand coefficient. So if you're asked to calculate price elasticity of demand, you're trying to get a figure that looks something like this. Now the last thing that we want to do in this lesson is how to interpret the price elasticity of demand coefficient. So we're going to start with the original formula, the price elasticity of demand, which is this. Now the law of demand states the reason why the demand curve slopes downwards is because we assume that the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. So if we plug that into the formula, price going up, which is represented by a positive percentage change in P, should always lead to the quantity demanded going down. That means that we're going to have a negative figure over a positive figure, and a negative divided by a positive is negative. Let's think about the other way. Let's say the price goes down. So if the price goes down, the law of demand says that the quantity demanded should go up. Here we're going to have a positive figure divided by a negative figure. Again, positive divided by negative is negative. So the first rule that we want to think about is that the price elasticity of demand is always going to be negative. Sometimes you'll even see some textbooks or even some past papers where they get a bit lazier, they just assume that you know that it's negative and they're actually going to say that it's positive. But for our purposes, I always want to think that the price elasticity of demand coefficient is negative. And we can see that why it's just because of the law of demand. So then we have to think to ourselves, well, knowing that it's negative, how do we know if something's elastic or inelastic? Well, let's go back to the original one that we had with the petrol there. So again, we've got the price elasticity of demand formula. In this case, it was a minus 
quantity demanded change over a 10% price increase, which gave us a figure of minus 0.5. Now if I'm looking at this, we had a fairly large, or relatively large, percentage increase in price, which was 10, compared to a relatively small percentage decrease in quantity demanded of 5. So if we have a product where the price changes quite a bit, and the quantity demanded doesn't change very much, that's always going to, have, that's always going to be a bottom-heavy fraction. That bottom-heavy fraction is always going to be something like minus 0.5. That figure is always going to be less than 1. So given this type of product where the price goes up but the demand doesn't really go down very much, this is what we would say is probably a product that's insensitive to price changes. So if we look back to the original slides, insensitive means that it's inelastic. So we can come up with a rule that says that the price elasticity of demand for inelastic products is between negative 1 and 0. It's going to be something like minus 0.5. And one, uh, another way that we can say this is that for inelastic products, it's going to be somewhere between minus 1, not inclusive, and 0, not inclusive. Let's see if we can do the same thing now for elastic products. So taking another example, let's say that we had something where if the price increased by 5%, the quantity demanded would go down by minus 10%. This would give us a price elasticity of demand coefficient of minus 2. Now let's think about this a bit carefully. Again, this was, this was something where the price increased relatively little to the way that the, that the quantity demand went down. Again, this is not, well, this is not going to be a bottom-heavy fraction, but a top-heavy fraction where the, where the quantity demanded has a bigger change than the price change. This is something that I would say then is sensitive to price changes, and a top-heavy fraction is always going to have a value of greater than 1, like the minus 2 that we see there. So the rule that we can come up with those products which are sensitive to price changes, which we said from our previous slides were elastic products, is to say that elastic products will always have a price elasticity of demand between minus infinity and minus 1. It's going to be something like minus 2, or maybe even higher than minus 2, but the, but the point is, is that that figure is always going to be more than one because it was a top heavy fraction. So mathematically we're going to say that for elastic products it's somewhere between minus infinity and minus one. The last thing we want to think about then is, well just to review, when the product the price elasticity of demand is between minus infinity and minus one the product is elastic. When the price elasticity of demand is between minus one and zero the product is inelastic. And there are still three other situations that we have to be aware of, and we'll investigate a bit further later. Is number one is that when the price elasticity of demand is exactly minus infinity, the product is said to be perfectly elastic. That means that, it, that if the price changes at all, the quantity of demand is, well, in theory, it's going to just change completely. Um, but we're going to see that it's, it's, it's extremely sensitive to price. When the price elasticity of demand is exactly zero, we're going to say that the product is perfectly inelastic, which means that no matter what the price changes, people are still going to demand the same amount of that product. And finally, a special case is that when the price elasticity of demand is exactly minus one, we're going to say that the product is unit elastic. And we're going to find out what some of the implications of that are in our next lesson. So, look back through the lesson objectives. Can you define price elasticity of demand? Can you explain the difference between elastic and inelastic products? Can you explain the determinants of, of price elasticity of demand, which is to say, what makes some products more price elastic or inelastic than others? Can you calculate the PED coefficient using the formula that was given? And can you interpret this PED coefficient given what the number is? Can you say if it's elastic or inelastic? You should check those things before, well, before you end the video because it's going to be important that you can um, that you can do those in lesson. So for the next lesson, we're going to interpret price elasticity of demand with relation to the demand curve. We're going to interpret the price elasticity of demand with relation to revenue, and we will explore the effect the price elasticity of demand has on government intervention, for example, taxes and subsidies. Again, if you have any questions, please email me.